My name is Paige Lachlan, and I have been at Wake Forest now for quite a long time. I think this is almost my 30th year here, and I like to say that's because I started working here when I was five years old, but obviously that's not true. And I am a professor of art, and I think I'm the Howard Tribble Professor at Wake Forest University. How I got started in art. I think I was very fortunate to have parents who actually appreciated original artwork. They took me to museums and to local galleries, not because we were rich patrons, but simply because they enjoyed art, and I realized that had a profound effect on me. But when I went to college at the University of Virginia, I had no thought of being an artist. I was either going to medical school or to law school, and then I took an art class my senior year in college and met the first living artist I'd ever met or worked with. Um, and I suddenly saw that this was actually a viable way to lead a life that was engaged and, um, and creative. So I abandoned law school and med school plans, much to the chagrin of my parents, and I moved to San Francisco and I got a job and I got a studio and I taught myself to paint pretty much and then I applied to graduate schools. I decided to apply to graduate school because I realized it got to the point where I had a lot of questions and I no longer knew how to find the answers to my questions and I mean that in the largest most metaphorical manner um, at which point my parents flipped out because I told them that this was no longer just a lark. I think they were trying to believe that, but a serious uh, lifetime pursuit. So after um, I basically put down my foot and said, I'm going to do this, you could either like it or not, that I prefer that they be, that they would be supportive. And they came around and they did, and they said, okay, if you're gonna go to graduate school, we'll try to go to the best graduate school we possibly can. And I was fortunate to get accepted to RISD and decided to go to Rhode Island School of Design to get my MFA in painting. And at that moment, I did not have any idea that I was going to teach. Uh, that was not the thought. And I was more interested in, in learning what the questions one asked about making art in a serious, an engaged manner. However, I was fortunate to have been offered a fellowship in graduate school and it was a, it had a teaching component and I found out in graduate school that I actually really liked to teach making art. That part of the reason I think I was successful at it is that I taught myself how to do this process that is very sophisticated and rich and almost impossible to master and it gave me a way to relate very directly with the students and helping them engage both in painting and in art making. So that's my, that's sort of my trajectory. <laughs> Welcome to my nightmare of an office. So it's part studio storage for me because artists make work they make things they need supplies they need materials and part of that is you have to have materials available to you so a lot of stuff is crates for shipping artwork to shows panels for making paintings um, aluminum panels for paintings student artwork everywhere examples for me to show students because you, it's easier to learn when they can see actual artwork um, oh my gosh it's a lot of stuff <laughs> sort of random things that end up on my wall there is no particular rhyme or reason there's some other things that should go up on the wall but I've run out of wall space obviously these are things that have been from students or friends or my daughter old photos with teaching. Somebody will give me something and I'll put it on the wall. This is from about 30 years ago. So it's a puppet the student made. Working with found materials. Which I think is really nice. That's a, a painting one student's painting. And she was not the best painter, but she was the most unabashed painter. So I just always loved that. 
artwork. And that's that hand is is a wax beeswax coated glove that I used in an art installation back when I used to do site specific artwork. And it was filled with honey and it would drip honey onto this stand. It's, so it's one, a singular bit from what was a larger art installation. Preserving as part of Southern culture and it was installed in a storefront window downtown in Atlanta. Um, so using mason jars, these are golden harvest mason jars, which is also somewhat appropriate. And uh, across the center is text, uh, the definition of the words to preserve, to conserve, to save, to keep, and to pickle. So uh, playing off this notion of how can you sort of preserve nature, how can you fix it, and is that not its own dilemma or controversy. So the tension between us both re revering and wanting to hold tight to something. Uh, the reverence comes in part the stained glass window reference as well. Um, or the necessity uh, to work with change and to not try to fix and, and keep in a preserved state. So what is it about teaching college students? That's a hard question, Carl. Um, I very much like working with the population of young adults that are on the cusp of absolute independence and what that means for leading their lives, how to transition out of childhood and dependency into young adulthood and independence. And teaching to me is about a lot about that. And then I realized part of it's I've worked for 30 years with the same population, same age bracket, same four-year group of people. So one of the things that I enjoy about that is it's an age I really understand. Um, I have a daughter who is now college age, and this might freak her out, but it is actually a population that I very much love and under I think I understand. I'm significantly older than my students, so there's a, a, obviously some age gap that and maybe sort of age centric cultural differences because of that but I do think I understand the basic um, psychology interests concerns motivations of, of college kids I shouldn't call them kids but hey everybody's good at heart so often I will hear a song on the radio or catch something driving to school and I heard this song this time <laughs> and it had a great rhythm it was it was it really made you want to move it had a lot of energy so I come to class and you guys do you know this song <laughs> they were like which song and I kept saying well you know I think it goes like this and I think the rhythm's like this and and when um when we finally, finally somebody said, is it this song? And they played it for me. It's like, yes, isn't that a great song? But it turns out there were some rather politically incorrect lyrics. So, note to self, listen to lyrics. You know, what's the road from intro to painting to, like, advanced painting seminar? The process hopefully unfolds over a three-year period of time. Um, Intro to painting is much more about teaching vocabulary and grammar. I think of it as almost like teaching a foreign language, and I have to get you up and running on the basic mechanics, um, even in some case down to alphabet, learning a new alphabet, if you will, um, so that you have some tools for communication. Then moving into second, third, or fourth semester of painting, is about what you communicate and how to learn to do that in the most sophisticated and pertinent and relevant manner while fine-tuning your grammar, your syntax, um, your material, awareness of your content, awareness of purpose and context, all these things start to come into play in more focused manner. Um, and a lot of it is also about engendering a degree of independence at the same time so that students become increasingly uh, authors of their own work 
and I'm helping push that work past the student's expectation of what they can achieve. <laughs> so you've just asked me about students or classes that I've had memorable relationships with. And I would say that I aim to make every single semester and every single class memorable hopefully for the students and hopefully in a positive way, but certainly for me, because otherwise it's not as enjoyable a process. But because Carly, you are filming me, I have to mention your class last spring. Da -da -da -da. Aww. Da -da -da -da. I do not always get to teach a class at the advanced level. I get to teach many classes at intermediate level, but but it is a rare occasion to teach a very large and full class of highly advanced painters and artists. And I was able to do that last spring, so it was a memorable group. Did superior work, although all my all my students do superior work. It's what I aim for. So. How's that for an answer? <laughs> <laughs> what my legacy be at Wake? I'd love to leave in a good art studio, like a physical facility for students to come be creative in. I would love to leave a great art studio, accessible to all, with a lot of materials available. A creative space, creative maker space, I would love to have that. I think it's really, really, really critically important that people recognize that um, we are surrounded by visual culture and visual language and that it has enormous, enormous impact and that um, people trivialize it and discredit it and don't pay attention to it and I think we are grossly undereducating young people if we don't make uh, visual, I'll just broadly call it visual education on the par with broadly Define verbal education, awareness of how to create, uh, analyze, manipulate, digest, enjoy visual material. So to the extent that I can make some aspect of that available to as many students as possible and that the university recognizes the criticality of that and puts financial support towards it so that it is valued, supported, and celebrated for all Wake Forest undergraduates, not just a small minority class who are willing to take the risk of making art, um, then I will hopefully help make it a better place. <laughs>